Hi, I'm Brian. Welcome to Autogafool and a very wet border area between France and Germany, where we have come to show you the sixth generation of the new Opel Corsa. Somewhat unbelievably, this year marks the 37th anniversary of Opel's Corsa. And until now, this was the most recent version. This is generation five. We're here today to take a test drive in the validation version of the sixth generation. Now, what does that mean? Well, generally there are four stages in cars development. The validation stage is the second stage. So it's not quite finished. Hence it is covered in camouflage. So, the interior design, the infotainment, none of that stuff is ready to be looked at. But the drivetrain and the car itself, well, that's around about 80% done. So we're able to bring you a very special behind the scenes look on quite what we can expect from the new model. Now, rather handily, we have managed to get ourselves a fifth generation. So although the car is very heavily camouflaged, we should be able to get a pretty decent idea of exactly what's to come when we're looking at the next generation. I'm gonna do a fair bit of hopping between the vehicles just to show you some details here. I think the first and most distinctive thing about the face of the fifth generation would have to be these lightning strike headlights. Now, one of the key elements that Opel were keen to look at when they looked at the new generation was lighting technology. So they're introducing full matrix LEDs at the front, optional of course, and LEDs at the back. Now that changes a lot what you're actually able to do with the face design of the car. And although we are heavily camouflaged up here, what you may just about be able to make out is that the lightning strike has gone, but in keeping with the brand design across other Opel lines, we now have this hockey puck lighting effect on the side. So generally, a lot more trimmed back. We still have the somewhat oval swoop design to the front bonnet, but as you can see, even in the camouflage form, and I'm gonna place my hand here quite a lot so you can try and get some contrast, there's a lot more sportiness to this car. Now, there's a very good reason for that. Although the overall exterior dimensions remain more or less unchanged from the predecessor, an awful lot has changed here. The wheelbase is now longer. That means that the front and rear overhangs are both significantly shorter. The car itself has dropped in height and that gives us a much more sporty, aggressive looking stance on the road. So even though clearly a lot of the camouflage design is intended to stop us from being able to see these shapes and these angles, what you can see when you directly contrast the two is that this looks very much like the standard form for small cars for definitely at least the last 10 years. This looks like a radical departure. Now, a lot of that is due to the fact that it features the new PSA platform that it will be sharing with its brand brothers, the Peugeot 208 and the DS3. Who's gonna win that fight, I wonder? What do you think? I wanna start with the profile of the fifth generation because it really does help you understand quite how dramatic the changes have been. As you can see, as you look back along the line, there is a lot here that looks awfully familiar. Around about four meters in length, and that's the sweet spot for the B segment class of vehicle. This could easily be mistaken for at least 10 other cars in its size and form. As you can see, there's a nice extended back. That's to increase the amount of available boot space at the rear. These doors give us plenty of room. Now you'll notice this is a five door model. For those of you who are big three door enthusiasts, I'm sorry to have to tell you that's not going to be continued into the sixth generation. But generally, although there are some nice character lines built into the design that does give it a unique and distinct styling, it doesn't really look radically different to many other cars on the road. Now, let's take a look at the sixth generation and see how that's changed. 
There are big changes going on in the profile and it doesn't matter how much camouflage they put on this thing, you can't hide the fact that it is now 48 millimeters lower. Now, in case you are an Imperial guy, that is about that much. That is a significant bike to have taken off the top, but I can tell you that there's actually more headroom on the interior than there was in the predecessor. And all of these changes are not only aesthetic, this has a lower drag coefficient in any model in the new generation than the most efficient of the older generation. So that's no small achievement. This extended wheelbase isn't either just there for effect. It's also now delivering a turning circle that is one and a half meters smaller than the predecessor. And that's really going to add up to a lot of change in the driving dynamic. But look at the design language itself. This is clearly a bold statement about the future of this car. It is so much more sporty than the predecessor. Clearly, it's hard to get a full impression of it whilst it is fully camouflaged up. But what I can tell you from looking at the contours directly is that the design character gently spreads out as we move towards the back. It accentuates here at the rear, which gives you a real sense of power at the back. Now that's a new direction for a smaller car. They're wanting it to look athletic, dynamic, sporty, not words you would automatically associate with a small family vehicle. And look at this. Again, not something you would expect to standardly find on the rear of a smaller car. This is going to be available to come in two different sizes or configurations, but whichever one you go with, it's still going to be more efficient than the predecessor. So, it's obviously hard to get a completely accurate picture, but to me, in a design purely assessment, this is a huge leap forwards, and I can't wait to find out what that extended wheelbase delivers once you start pushing it around those bends. Nowhere is that change quite more pronounced than when you get round to the back. Just look at the variation in styling here. Now, this presents exactly the same way as so many other small cars have done for a very long time. This is more of a taste of something a little bit more sporty, aggressive and stylish. So you might well think, yeah, yeah, but look at the rake on that roof and that flat back. There is no way that you're going to be able to fit the same amount of boot space in one of those as you can in one of these. Well, thanks to the new chassis, I can tell you this actually takes 24 more litres at 309 in the rear of this car. So not only does it look significantly better, but you can fit significantly more things in it. It's not only the load space that's improved in the car, it's also the load width. This boot is now 74 millimeters. That's around about that wider than the predecessor. So you can see straight away how much easier this will be to load than the fifth generation. And it really helps set off these new LEDs in the rear as well. This looks aggressive, sporty and dynamic. How are the driving instructors of the world going to feel about that? Well, I guess we'll have to wait to find out. Well, the engine lineup was important to Opel as well. So at launch, you're going to be able to buy these with a petrol or diesel engine. The petrols go from 75 to 130 horsepower, all three cylinder, and they're going to come either with a six speed manual or a brand new eight speed automatic gearbox. If you want to go diesel, that's 100 horsepower and it comes with the six speed manual. Now, later on, there will be a fully electric model. And although that's not available until the end of the year, you will be able to start placing your orders for it from June. When Opel decided they wanted to redesign the Corsa, they did so with a shopping list. They really wanted to focus on weight, driving position, handling, of course, engine lineup and lighting tech. Well, they've made significant changes in each one of those areas, but the things that strike you most when you first sit in the new Corsa, albeit the very heavily camouflaged new Corsa, are how much they've addressed those initial things. The driver's position has changed completely from the predecessor. Mainly the reason for that is that the previous Corsa feels an awful lot like, forgive me for saying it, your first car. The Corsa that's currently available, or the fifth generation of Corsa, is one of the most popular cars on the road with driving instructors. And the reason is that it is very new driver friendly. You have a heightened seating position, 
really good all-round visibility and the drive isn't too exciting to distract from your ability to concentrate on what you're supposed to be doing which is after all learning to drive. Well I can't help but wonder if in this respect Opel have decided to a little bit throw the baby out with the bathwater. This car is radically different from the moment that you sit in it. It feels very much like an entirely new beast. Now of course you would expect that with the brand new platform that we're getting here from the PSA group but what's interesting is the intention of the car as well. Sure you're always going to get slight subtle changes every time you come out with a new version of a car but they're rarely quite so pronounced and particular as this. You can't help but notice it. From the moment you sit into this car, I say into it because you're that much lower in the vehicle. Not only has the weight been radically addressed in this vehicle, we're now down by 10% over the predecessor's weight, which puts the lightest one of the new breed of courses at under 1,000 kilos in weight. So that's significant. Add to that a 15% increase in torsional stiffness, a much lower center of gravity and a lower driving position, and you really have significantly reevaluated what it means to be a Corsa driver. So what are we sitting in right now? Well, I think it's important to point out that with these test drives, you're not getting a finished product. So generally cars have four stages of production development. This car is only stage number two. So there's a big reason why we're not allowed to show you huge parts of this vehicle. It's not because it's massively secret, it's because it simply isn't done yet. So broadly speaking, the reason that we're here today is to experience not only how the drive has been modified, changed and developed for this vehicle, and in their design terms, the drive system is about 80% mature on this vehicle. In other words, we really do have the opportunity to get a very good experience of what the new Corsa will be like to drive. But everything else isn't quite there yet, which is why we can't see it and we can't show it and we're not interacting with it. But that doesn't change quite the smile that it puts on my face to be able to see just what Opel are thinking at this stage in terms of what this car is going to be able to deliver. Now the one that we're sitting in is the top of the petrol engine, so that's 130 horsepower petrol. It's got new particle filters, so the CO2 emissions are really right the way down. How is the drive? Well, it's very difficult to explain how different this is to the predecessor of the fifth generation. I think the main significant change is that that car doesn't really feel particularly dynamic and sporty. From the moment you leave in this one, you really want to throw it into some corners and have some fun with it. The lower seating position, the lower center of gravity, all help add to a very significant change in this drive. I don't know how many people have really gotten that much excitement, well, other than first driving experiences out of herring around the streets in a standard engine Corsa, but I can tell you, we've tried the smaller engine and because of this new chassis design, it's very impressive just quite how much fun you can have in this car, albeit that it's not the most powerful car in the world. So again, sadly, we don't have any numbers for you, but I would absolutely tell you that the single most significant change for me, for the driving experience, is the lower center of gravity combined with that increase in torsional stiffness. It's totally changed the driving characteristic of this car. And what that all means summed up in the easiest way I can possibly put it, is the amount of contact that you feel with the road. Now, right now, we're in a little bit of traffic, so we're not driving quite at the speed that I might like to really give you the full experience of what the car can deliver. But I can tell you, it's genuinely surprising how much agility they've gotten into this new model. The old one was one of those cars where I would have said, you can learn to find its sweet spots and you can really start having fun if you find the way to play with the handling to get it just right. That's often the challenge with a smaller car. But with this car, you get that right from the start. Everything about this says, gone, have a bit more fun. Whilst that works really very well indeed for me, I'm more than a little bit curious to see what the nation's driving instructors will make of it. So that's what I immediately like about this car. 
Also, I have to tell you that the brand new eight-speed gearbox twins very nicely with the engine indeed. Now, this is a small car and its first and primary function isn't likely to be sports. So I think I'm probably gonna say, why not start off with one of the smaller engines? After all, you're gonna have a little bit to go to convince anyone that this is a true sporty hot hatchback. So I don't know that 130 horses in such a lightweight new Corsa is really necessary. But sure, if you want, why not? Let's talk about the overall driving experience. Well, as you may be able to see on camera, I'm very pleasantly surprised to see the amount of headroom that I have in this car. I'm five foot 10 or 178 centimeters, but very short legs, very long torso. So I compare it around about six foot, six foot one for my driving height. As you can see, I've got ample room above me and that makes the car feel very comfortable indeed. What I'm a bit sad about, but I think really it's a compromise that had to be made is definitely my lack of visual real estate. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're gonna make the exterior that much more sporty, if you're gonna prioritize making the driving experience and the seating experience paramount, you're gonna suffer a little bit with reduced windows. So I do definitely have less glass to look out of. Now, if you're noticing that the exposure here looks a little on the dark side, you must remember that's because everything behind me is covered in camouflage film. So obviously it would be an awful lot lighter once we get to the actual proper press release of this vehicle. In the meantime, I can see what the car is giving me structurally. And by comparison to its predecessor, that is really quite a large A pillar at the front. And I have to say a very large B pillar behind me. So I have to be honest, the all around visibility is not as good in this car. And there have been more than a couple of junctions that I've pulled up to and thought, gosh, I really don't have the ability to see quite as much as I would like. But I think that's a fair compromise to have had to have made for improving the drive this much. I really can't say enough good about how this new chassis is performing in combination with the engine and the gearbox. It's changed the dynamic and the statement of this car completely. Now, along with other things that are being left behind with the last generation, you won't be seeing any more three-door models. So from a practicality standpoint, you're gonna be more than happy ferrying around the kids or the grandparents in the back of this A to B, but what really makes the difference is the amount of fun that you're gonna be able to have when they're not in the car. Again, we don't have any numbers to give you, but if the efficiency matches the drive as successfully, I really think this car has an awful lot to offer. Don't forget, it should come in at a very competitive price point, and not only that, but we will be very excited to see just what the pure electric platform has to offer when it comes out at the end of this year. Now, in terms of direct competition, well, it won't have escaped your notice that this car, or this platform, I should say, is also being used for the Peugeot 208 and, of course, the DS3. Very different animals. Since Opel got taken over by the PSA group. Clearly some things that used to be direct rivals are now, I would say, brand brothers and sisters. I don't see that as being a bad thing for the car's development because it has meant that they've been able to do an awful lot of mixed shopping for all of those platforms. So this should all add up to only benefit the consumer. Now there won't be as much going on, I would imagine, in price competition terms as before, but you do have very distinct brand offerings. The 208 is a huge seller. So I think whatever they do, there are going to be direct comparisons between how Peugeot and how Opel have used this platform to the best of their abilities. But I think you are gonna see cars with very distinct and different characters and characteristics, and it is going to come down an awful lot to taste. Now, I haven't had the opportunity to drive the 208 yet, but I have seen it in Geneva. And I have to say, stylistically, that's pushing an awful lot of buttons that I think are gonna to appeal to people. We still have no idea what the finished course is going to look like on the interior. But if it's finished as politely and nicely, but stylishly as the drive, well, watch out, Peugeot. I think you may have a fight on your hands. This is where you really start seeing what the new Corsa can deliver. We're out on some really nice, twisty country roads. And I think you're probably picking up on the sound. That engine's sounding pretty nice. That's just three cylinders. 
And I can't think off the top of my head when I last heard a three-cylinder engine that sounded as favorable to me as this does. Well, it's taking these roads in nicely in its stride and there's nothing here that's causing it any challenge at all, but huge amounts of fun to be had. The roads are very wet and I don't really know the surface that well, so I have a distinct feeling that I could be pushing this car a lot harder than I am, but always safety first. Still, what I am able to get is a distinct feeling of not only the fun, but also the potential handling of this car. It's great. You simply wouldn't want to do this in the fifth generation. Ah, you could, but I think you'd be spending a little bit less time smiling, a little bit more time looking nervous. It just feels really good. The connection between the driver and the road is excellent, and the whole car comes together to deliver an experience that for a small car is really very refined indeed. Steering's nice and crisp now, a lot's been done with that. What they've actually done is they've rack mounted the electric motor, which gives you the power assist on the steering, down on the frame itself. That really reduces the weight higher up and puts that weight lower down. Technically, that's quite challenging to do, but you really can feel the benefit in not only that, but all the other changes that have been made thanks to this new chassis in order to be able to deliver such a great driving experience. Now, a fair comparison isn't really gonna take place until we get to do the exact same thing with the 208 to see who has used that technology better. But it really sets up a nice rivalry for the future, and I think something which we as customers are gonna go on to benefit from for years. Not least, because long after we've forgotten how much fun we were having in these internal combustion engine vehicles, these chassis are ready to let us see what the future holds when we have fully electric available to us later on this year. Yeah, I know, it's not quite as romantic as the internal combustion engine, but it is the future. And in the same way that this car has changed, I guess we all have to change a bit too. And if it's half as much fun as it is to drive around here in the petrol, well, it won't be an entirely bad thing. So that's the automatic, but now we get the chance to try out the manual to see what we think about that. Now, this car has the 100 horsepower 1.2 liter petrol engine. And I have to tell you, initial impressions are that this is actually great. When you compare it to the 130, I'm not missing that extra power. Really, a car of this size and this profile should be all about being nippy, and you get that in spades. Now, Opel were keen to point out to us that this gearbox isn't quite the finished article, so they did ask us to be somewhat gentle when describing it. And you do have to look through a little bit. There is definitely some refining that's still required here but you do have more than enough to give you the impression about what the interplay will be like between this six-speed manual and this 100 horsepower engine. I have to tell you what I'm looking for from a small car with a manual gearbox is fun. Really, if efficiency is your bag, nowadays, most automatic gearboxes are so well delivered that you just don't need to think about driving them too much. You can still have an awful lot of fun out of a manual in a small car. If you listen to that note, there's still a lot of pleasing driving experience to be had out of this. Now, I don't wanna to say too much about that manual gearbox because there is unquestionably refinement to be made. What do I mean by that? Well, there is quite a lot of travel on it and it just feels like it needs tightening up a little bit. But once you do get into that gear, delivery of that power is absolutely superb. Once again, we're feeling the benefit of that increased torsional stiffness, 15%, don't forget. It's really making a difference in the handling of this car. Steering so much more direct than the predecessor. And once you get into a corner, oh, it's lovely. I can think of quite a lot of very much more expensive cars that at least at first don't feel as if they have the handling capacity that I'm enjoying here. Corners just fly by. The only thing I'm not completely certain of is how well these tires are capable of handling in the wet. So I'm still holding back a little bit on what I might quite like to do, but I can tell you that I'm having more than enough fun as it is. So, with little to go off, but still having had a chance to drive a few different variants, this is my pick so far. Yes, I think the automatic gearbox is great, but you are robbing yourself of just a little bit of fun and I suspect you might be adding a little bit more in terms of price. 
So my pick, right at the early stages, is the 100 horsepower petrol 1.2 with the six-speed manual gearbox. Why? Because it's made me smile most. And in a car like this, that's really what I want. So, how does the drive compare to the larger engine automatic? Well, I think you are experiencing just a little bit more weight with that larger engine. And as crazy as this sounds, you do notice it. Bearing in mind that so much of the driving profile of this car has to do with the amount of weight that they've saved off the design and the lowering of that center of gravity, it almost goes without saying, the less additional weight you can add into that picture, the happier you're going to be. This is a light car, it's much better to keep it that way. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I could stand to lose a little bit too, and I'm sure that would just add a little bit more fun. Well, maybe if I owned one of these, it would be enough motivation for me to get there. But even if I don't, there's more than enough to be said for driving around in this car with the smaller engine. You're gonna get better efficiency, plenty of power, and still an awful lot of smiling. Well, of course, we were always gonna have quite a lot of fun on those out of town roads, but how does it compare to the previous generation once you get it in town? Well, there's obviously not a huge amount to get excited, but it's polite, it's friendly, it doesn't feel in any way too sporty or too dynamic for a nice shopping trip. I am particularly interested though to know how older drivers will get on with this. They do like that upright, slightly higher position. And I wonder if the new positioning of the Corsa will knock out some of that driving segment to other models. I'm not quite sure how older drivers will adjust or adapt or feel about this experience. So if any of you are watching, I would very much like to know what your initial impressions are. Now, in line with nice driving through town, if you do decide you wanna go with the automatic model, you're gonna get two things automatically. The first is that it will come with four driving mode selector. Now, because these are early version test vehicles, we haven't really been able to give that a fair go on the automatic. But the second that comes as standard is you will get shift paddles built into the steering wheel they come as standard on any automatic model. So if you're a fan of being able to do that, you're gonna get that no matter what. And I think that's probably worth mentioning. Well, in England, we have an expression, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And what it broadly speaking means is, if you're trying to bring about change, don't forget the thing that made it popular before you go about changing it. Well, when I look to the way that Opel have decided to evolve the Corsa, it feels that they haven't just thrown away the baby and the bathwater, they also set fire to the house and moved to a different district. Is that a good thing? Well, that very much depends upon your taste and your needs. The thing that I like particularly about the fifth generation of this car is very much the thing that makes it so popular with driving instructors the world over. And that is, it's so easy to use. It's so friendly to new drivers. It's so straightforward. There's nothing dramatic, either good or bad. Sorry, Opal, to discover about this car. It is exactly what you're expecting. That has all completely changed with this car. It's now dynamic. It's aggressive. Now, obviously, the introduction of the PSA platform was always going to radically change the way that this car operated within the marketplace. And this is the product of a lot of years of internal discussion in Opel about what direction they want the company to go in. In the longer term, that's likely to look fully electric. And we're all very excited to see how that gets applied to this platform. In the shorter term, I guess it really does come down to how much you like the car as it currently is. If you really are all about the drive, but you like the functionality as well, there is nothing here to get upset about. This car has only improved. The new drive is fantastic. You're still gonna get all of the functionality you want and even more of that. Think larger boot, think more headroom, think more interior space. Those are all benefits that come with the new platform. If, however, what you liked was the extended ride height, the fact that it was very easy, you know, a little bit lackluster around town. Well, I don't know how you're gonna feel about this design change. It is radically different, but I think that's a good thing and I can't wait to hear what you think. Pricing should be competitive. For me, the battle is less between old and new and more between brand and brand. This is a big, bold statement from Opel. We've already seen what Peugeot have done with the same platform, 
DS3 is going to come out and give us a different take again. And I can't wait to hear what everybody thinks about who's done the best job with it. Until then, if you have any comments or suggestions or questions, please pop them below. We hope you've enjoyed watching and we hope we'll see you again soon.